Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining us after the session. I'm sure you've had a good time with your family and friends uh, who are marking Eid al Adha and uh, others who are based elsewhere. Uh, thank you very much for staying with us at this very important session. Uh, this session is very important to us for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, the role of patient entrepreneurs in African healthcare. I think this is something that has for long been ignored. And it is something that we have to really tackle if we have to go forward and build back better. If we leave everything in our healthcare systems to other people, then there's likelihood that uh, A, our voice will not be heard, B, our perspectives will not be uh, incorporated into the healthcare products and services. And lastly, there's a very likely chance that we will get um, health devices, services, medicines that are not appropriate for us, they're not acceptable to us, and they're near, neither of quality or safe. So if you want to change uh, the environment, the ecosystem that we have, we must engage in this um, uh, overall um, presentation. Now I'll go down to the speakers first uh, to introduce you. So firstly, Emily Sheldon. Emily, thank you very much for really... Emily is in one of those unique positions that uh, she was so concerned about African healthcare innovation problems throughout the African continent. So this is not about charity. This is about co-creation in its real sense. Patients taking uh, stakeholding, investing time and money, and in fact, owning some of the entrepreneurial companies themselves and bringing in those facilities. She's keen on bringing training into the things, capacity building program designs. And being a co-founder of this, she really is pushing hard to improve health outcomes. So Emily, welcome. The second, uh, I'm so pleased to announce that from, from the perspective of Africa, uh, Chief Amel Tata Kongoso, he is a tribal chief. And uh, this is something very rare in uh, global health policy that we do not recognize the role of local leaders in improving healthcare systems. Uh, Chief Tata has really worked hard. He has taken best practice uh, from all over the world and taking it back to in, in his community and even nationally. So Chief Tata, thank you very much for your time and uh, we really salute you for having joined us today and brought that perspective from Cameroon that we really need uh, of the, how tribal chiefs must play. And I, when I grew up in Kenya and every time I remember the chief, local chiefs were very important in improving education, public health and uh, others. But later on, as things progressed, uh, centralist governments took over, then the role of these uh, positions were uh, undermined and diluted. We need to really focus on them. Uh, there is nothing like a good tribal chief to improve things. Next speaker will be uh, Padma. Uh, Kaman, uh, Kam, Kamat, uh, who is the Director of uh, Regulatory and Scientific Affairs in the Global Self-Care Foundation. Dr. Kam, uh, Padma has really focused on uh, how engagement within the regulatory and scientific affairs can really improve uh, 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 self-care. Uh, and she's looking at innovation in that self-care uh, arena because I think that is where we sometimes have to do it ourselves, bring in innovation ourselves. We Each of us has got an opportunity to do that. And uh, coming back uh, from her previous uh, graduation and um, Mark, she's coming with chemical engineering background and a doctorate in that, which really, really knows that this is an individual uh, who also uh, went through the London School of uh, Economics and Political Sciences, so she really, wears a heart of her sleeve, as I say, on this issue with so much passion. And least, uh, but uh, not last, uh, or le last but not least, uh, uh, our board member uh, from Africa, BC from uh, Nigeria, who is a community pharmacist, who has really played active role in innovating community pharmacist's role in uh, healthcare. And she has really brought about uh, new initiatives and is now probably going to even share that we are looking at a Pan-African Patients Alliance to look at these whole issues. 
So I will now hand over to the good hands of uh, BC Bright. Uh, BC, uh, you take over from me. Thank you. Over to you now. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Kawadi. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you are. It's a privilege and honor to have you join us here today. And um, this session, um, our CEO, Kawadi, has gone through a lot already, but I'll just quickly give you the um, topic of the session. It's titled African Healthcare Innovation. Is there a room for patient engagement and co-creation in, um, in healthcare innovation? Now, patient co-creation may sound very new to many people in Africa because really patients in Africa have not really been co-creating healthcare. And it's a new thing in the global scene. It's been more pronounced in these days of COVID and the pandemic. And so we need to embrace uh, patient co-creation in Africa. And if you recall, um, during the last session, NEDA, what our, our vice chair in IAPO, actually mentioned the importance of patient co-creation in determining uh, patient uh, safety. And she, she emphatically talked about uh, the patient health safety. Day. So we're looking at patient co-creation and patient engagement. Those are the two key topics we're going to look at uh, during this session. Um, I don't want to take up, uh, take up too much of our time because we have limited time for the speakers. But among the things we're going to talk about, we're going to look at the COVID-19 forced uh, lockdown, the outcomes of the, the lockdown. And then we look at, um, we, we will also delve into patient safety and the medicine. We're going to look at uh, how the um, adverse uh, drug outcomes and adverse outcomes of the vaccine, as well as safety reporting, the processes in Africa. We're also going to look at uh, patient co-created digital healthcare, where patients can now enjoy facilities like um, um, telehealth, health technology assessments, and so on. It's a lo whole lot of uh, innovative things, and uh, we're just in, in all, we're going to talk about healthcare innovation today. And then, like Carl Deep has told us, we have some eggheads that are here to help us flush out the topic. Now, I'll, I'll start by introducing to us Emily, a very elegant lady um, and a holder of the Masters in Public Health. Emily Sheldon is the co founder and CEO of the African Health Innovation Center. I mean, what could be more innovative than having? An innovative health innovation health center for the whole of Africa. And Emily is going to talk to us on shaping patient engagement in healthcare innovation in Africa. Once she's done, she, she will have 10 minutes. And then once Emily is done, I'll hand over to our um, chief from Cameroon, Chief Consul Emile Tata. He is CEO of the Center for the Promotion and Protection of Patient Rights in Cameroon. So you can see that he is a very relevant person for this topic. And last but not the least, we will have Padmala Kamas, a doctoral um, a researcher and degree holder, who is director, regulator, and scientific affairs, um, in charge of the scientific affairs globally um, for the Global Self-Care Federation. So the point where patient self-care comes in will be highlighted by Padmala. So you see that there are all new dimensions to patient care and the patient himself or herself. So I thank you all for joining us. And I will hand over now to Emily, who will talk to us, Emily Sheldon, who will talk to us for 10 minutes on Shaping patient engagement in healthcare innovation in Africa. Over to you, Emily. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, BC, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to the International Alliance of Patient Organizations for hosting this conversation and for inviting us to join. My name is Emily Sheldon. I'm the co founder and CEO of the African Health Innovation Center in Accra, Ghana. And today I'm really excited to talk about patient inclusion and innovation. 
Um, the African Health Innovation Center, uh, well, we started actually as the Health Innovation Program of Impact Hub Accra. We started as a health project of an entrepreneurship center five years ago in Ghana. And we founded, we had a few small events. And what we found is that initially, folks were really confused when we came to talk to them about health innovation. Why does someone from an entrepreneurship center want to come speak to a ministry of health, a health service or a hospital? But over the past five years, the excitement, the understanding and the awareness around the role innovation and entrepreneurship play in health has dramatically grown. Two years ago, we decided to break off and form our own, our own organization, the African Health Innovation Center. And we've been growing bigger and bigger ever since then. We do pretty diverse work. Um, and I can just tell you a little bit about us before I talk about patients. Um, everything from incubating and accelerating startups, which means we work with small health businesses to help them understand their business model, their revenue streams, and how to work with regulatory agencies. We connect health startups with impact investors to help them raise money. We host a lot of workshops around design thinking, which I'm gonna speak more about during this session. We do some consultancy services, and we do a lot of special events and hackathons, which is where we bring people together to identify challenges in their communities or in their health centers, brainstorm new solutions, and put together the basic business model of what that idea is. We've been doing this for the past five years, and we found that every year people are getting more and more excited, but we're still lacking one thing, which is participation by patients. While we're doing this across the board in multiple countries across the continent, it's rare to see patient participation and it's even rarer to see people stepping up and having patients lead a lot of these conversations. So first, what I wanna talk about with you is what do I even mean by innovation within health and healthcare? Where are we seeing it now? I wanna give you a couple of examples and I wanna talk about some of the gaps when it comes to patient engagement and what I think we can do about that. This presentation is really going to be more of a general overview to a conversation about patient engagement. And I'm happy to answer more deep dive questions in our Q&A period. So first, how has the health sector embraced innovation, um, especially throughout Sub-Saharan Africa? Now, I've been living in Ghana for the past five years uh, since we founded AHIC, and I've had the opportunity to travel to over a dozen countries throughout the continent. Um, part of my job, what makes it so fun and so exciting, is I essentially get to tour different health innovation spaces. I get to see some of the up and coming ideas. And the fact is that there are some really exciting things happening on the continent. Now, throughout the world, we have a number of specialized health innovation centers, something we're not really seeing in Africa right now, but we know they're being planned and they're growing in the next few years. The second is simulation labs, and you all may have seen some of these. They're often based at teaching hospitals, and they basically simulate an exact scenario. It's where you practice surgery or anesthesia before it takes place. And now we're seeing more innovative ideas about how we can simulate public health settings, including pandemics as well. The third is new products and services. When people are actually creating a new medical device, a new mobile health app, um, and I'm gonna give you a few examples of those. This is where we really see things taking off. We're seeing new products and services developed all across the continent, and they're growing at different rates some locally and some going to scale now active in multiple countries. We also see telehealth, mHealth, digital health, whichever title you wanna go with, especially in an era of COVID-19, people are starting to see how we can leverage feature phones, smartphones, Zoom, or other ways of connecting to make sure that patients, even in the most remote areas, have access to specialized care. We also know that electronic health records and ways for patients to access their health records, maybe via a mobile app is becoming more common. 
And finally, we're also seeing innovation in what I would call leadership and management. I think a lot of times there's some confusion that innovation has to be a new form of technology. While tech is a huge part of innovation, it's not the only thing. As we see people be more open-minded about the way they manage healthcare teams, about the way they measure impact, that's a form of innovation as well. You can see here, these are some of the areas we've had the privileges of touring over the past few years, whether they're universities with maker spaces that do 3D printing, whether they're newly unveiled surgical suites, or whether they're incubation programs that are taking young people with big ideas and helping them develop their businesses. All across the continent, real change is starting to occur. Now, one of the examples I wanna give you is three health startups that I think are doing really interesting work across the African continent. Um, first, let's talk about Redbird Health Tech. Now, Redbird Health Tech is based out of Ghana and they work with pharmacies to try and decrease non-communicable diseases by allowing um, rapid point of care testing to take place at the pharmacy level. Let's say you have diabetes and you need to have your insulin checked on a regular basis. Instead of going to stand in a queue at a pharmacy, or I'm sorry, at a hospital, you could actually go to your local pharmacy. They can take your insulin. And not only do they have a back-end health system that's checking and seeing how you're doing each day or each week, but they also have a mobile app where you can track your own information yourself as a patient. If you needed to go to a hospital, you have that patient data available to share with the doctor so they can see how you're doing over time. I also want us to look at Sisu Global Health. They're an American company, but they're currently active in Kenya. They've developed a product called Hemafuse, which allows you to recycle blood during a blood transfusion process so that you don't need a blood donation from somewhere else. It doesn't require electricity and it allows blood to be reused right at the source. The third I wanna talk about is Gricht, which is based out of Nigeria and is a cold chain technology solution originally used in agriculture, but now being used for medications, vaccines, um, and blood tests or samples. Since COVID-19 started, they've actually been able to take COVID tests and move them around the country using kind of in internet of things, AI, advanced technology to measure how long something is staying cold, the temperature at which it's staying cold, and how long it takes to get from location to location. This device can also be strapped to the back of a motorbike and it can allow the kind of bumps that happen when going through last mile communities into urban areas to be able to actually do the testing, share the blood or whatever they happen to be carrying at that time. One of the things I love about all three of these organizations is that they've all used a lot of design thinking and patient information when developing their device, their technology, or their service. All three of these groups spoke with patients countless times before going to scale with their product. And you can see it in the way that their product works. Now, the sad truth though, is that a lot of organizations aren't consulting patients. And when hospitals or governments or ministries go to scale, patient voices aren't included. Now that happens for a number of reasons, but I wanna highlight just a couple of them. And I know I only have a couple of minutes left. The first is that there are people that are afraid of malpractice or litigation. We see this taking place more in uh, later stage economies like the United States, but it's starting to become more common throughout the African continent. There's also a fear of managing too many stakeholders. Folks who head hospitals might be afraid, if our doctors and our patients disagree, who do we go with? And so they leave one voice out of the conversation. There's also a lot of traditional hierarchy structures. We have to face the facts. People think that doctor voices, nurse voices matter more than the average patient. And some people believe that patients don't have that much to contribute. But we all know, I'm sure everyone sitting in this conference knows that everyone is an expert in their own experience and that patients have information that could transform the way that healthcare is delivered. 
Not only am I the CEO and co-founder of a health innovation organization, but I'm the parent of a child with a rare medical condition. And I can tell you that I learned just as much from my personal experience as I do from my professional experience. So what can be done to increase patient presence? And this is something so we can stay on time. Um, I really wanna make sure we get to more in Q&A. Incorporating tools like design thinking, identifying specific places in planning and development for patients to provide input, hosting third-party patient conversations. How do we get patient feedback, but not to the nurse or doctor that you feel might take it out on you if you give them feedback that's, that's not in line with what they think? And how do we encourage lived experience? How do we get people who are making decisions high up to actually stand and walk in the shoes of people who are waiting for eight hours without a chair, without a clean toilet in a hospital system to get care right now? Those are a lot of the things we want to reflect on. I wanna finish on time, but I'm so happy to answer Q&A. And if I don't reach your question today, here's a copy of my email address and I would love to have further conversation. HIC works throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and we're really, really passionate about adding patient voice into the innovation conversations we host now. Thanks so much and back to you, BC. Thank you very much, Emily. That was very, very apt, very precisely delivered. Uh, you did raise a few key points. Uh, in, in particular, you emphatically talked about design thinking, and you also recommended design thinking as one of the solutions. You also gave us a few innovative things like recycling of blood during transfusion, which is very new and will be very useful. In, um, in a low income economy like we have in most African countries. And then you also mentioned that um, there are several tools that could be used. You mentioned some of those new tools like telehealth, et cetera, et cetera. But you actually recommended uh, that there should be third party uh, patient conversation. And that's a very, very interesting one. I, I wonder who you would recommend those to be the third party. Would that be the public health practitioner or what? Um, that sounds really interesting. It's a party that can actually convey the patient's voice um, to the practitioners. And I, I think that it was just a suggestion that there should really be a tripartite relationship between the patient, the practitioner, and uh, the health system. And then we leave it back to, we take it back to you, Ghana, to help us work that out. So thank you very much, Emily. We really appreciate your. Um, conversation. That was really good. Thank you. I'm sure the questions will come up. We'll take all the questions at the end, so I hope you don't mind. But there's a portal, so we will, we will have it all the questions that have been directed at you. Thank you very much. So thank you all for listening. I'm sure you all benefited a lot from that brilliant uh, paper by Emily Sheldon, co-founder and CEO of the African Health Innovation Center located in Ghana. So next, we are going to have our chief from Cameroon, Chief Consul Emily Carter. He is the CEO of the Center for the Promotion and Protection of Patients' Rights in Cameroon. And he's going to tell us, he's going to take us through how African-led innovation during the pandemic um, um, it's uh, how African, he's going to take us through African led um, innovation during this pandemic and then um, on access to healthcare and patient safety. So, three things really the African led innovation, access to healthcare, and patient safety. Chief Tata, over to you. Thank you very much. Adam Bisi, uh, thank you for that wonderful innovative uh, introduction. I'm just so wonderful to uh, partake in this gathering. And I will be talking on African led innovations during pandemic on access and patient safety. You know, in a garden such as this, I will not want to mention name, but if you grant me latitude, 
I will want to say that I stand on the protocol duly established. And following my topic, I will want to start with the lessons that COVID-19 has taught us. COVID-19 as a pandemic has taught us a lesson that no other thing has taught us. It has taught us that our healthcare systems are underfunded. COVID-19 has taught us that we have no pharmaceutical industries worth talking about. COVID-19 has taught us that we need to innovate and invent in the healthcare domain and on patient access and patient safety. COVID-19 has taught us that in the person of George Bernard Shaw, that his submission in the year 1952, when he was asked about his views on the healthcare system, he was of the opinion that we haven't lost faith into the medical profession, and that is what makes that profession the profession of a well-cultivated gentleman. That is what makes that profession the profession of nobility. Now, descending from that contention, uh, permit me to also uh, submit to you the view of Michel Montaigne, a French philosopher, whom in the year 1953, The success of medical practitioners walks through the sun. Meanwhile, their failures are buried in the grave under the canon of confidentiality. At this juncture, COVID-19 has taught us a lot of lessons. COVID-19 has taught us that there is need to invent, that there is need to create, that there is need to innovate. And that is why if we don't understand and take into cognizance some of these lessons that COVID-19 has taught us, then I will be submitting to you that we will be suffering from what I may term congenital amnesia. Now, what then are the things, what are then the innovations that have been initiated in the African healthcare system during this pandemic? Going to Madagascar in the year 2020, in the month of May, you could discover that the president of, of, of Madagascar in the person of uh, Rojalina was of the view that Madagascar has come up with what it is called, what we call the COVID organic, which is both a curative and a preventive cure to COVID-19. Now you come to Douala in Cameroon, you could see the essential oils of uh, Bishop Archbishop Cleda Samuel, who said he is able to cure COVID-19 using these herbal, herbal products. In Cameroon also, we were able to come up with some, uh, some uh, alcoholic uh, gel to sanitize hands and other environment, and environment because of this COVID-19. Now going to, to Ghana, you could discover that the thalamus industry was able to create this application, the telehealth, which Dr. Emeline, I recommend her for her services to humanity. She was able to use that, that application to render healthcare services from a distance to patients. And that was in consonant with the WHA resolution 54 on telehealth and in consonant with the World Medical Association statement on telehealth of the year 1992. And now coming to, to Cameroon, we could also discover some of the innovations like people were using ginger and lemon and other things so that they could combine them and drink them in, as a preventive measure to this COVID-19 pandemic. Now going also, to Ethiopia, we could discover that to the long African disease control and prevention center, we have had other five ones that were added 
to that one in Addis Ababa. We had also one which was in Kenya. We had another one in Egypt. We had another one in Zambia. We had another one in Gabon. We had another one in Nigeria. So these are some of the innovations. You go back to Ghana, you could discover that the red birds, a telehealth industry was able to come out with drones that were used to transport blood from the hospital to those places where patients needed them. And still in Ghana, we had the Tendo application, which was created by some of the students under the canopy and the guidance of the United Nations Development Program, so that they could sell products from a distance without actually uh, people coming closer because one of the rules or one of the measures to curb the aspect of COVID-19 is to reduce congestion. Now we look at also still in Ghana, another child came up with the application, the Dave Can Talk, which was a mobile app to facilitate communication and information sharing with the deaf people in, in relation to the COVID-19. Those are some of the innovations that we have had in Africa and in, in Cameroon as well in relation to this COVID-19. Now, we are talking in this, uh, in this era about patient safety. We are talking about patient access to better healthcare facilities. And I want to start by submitting to you that when we talk about this aspect of patient safety, it is not something which is new in our own present day dispensation. It has existed from time immemorial. And when you look at the international conventions, this aspect of the right to health was incorporated, uh, starting with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the year 1948. When you look at Article 25, you go to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights of the year 1966. Article 12, you come to the African Chapter on Human and People's Rights of the year 1981, which came into force in some six years after in its Article 16. We could see that most of these conventions talks about the right to health, but they fail to put in place structures to that effect. And that is why I want to submit to you that with the present day dispensation, the COVID-19 has taught us a lot of things. But if we learn from these lessons, we are not supposed to sit down and wait because COVID-19 has not left us. And COVID-19 is not yet the last pandemic. We are talking about the concept of patient safety. In Cameroon, we, there is this aspect in the British healthcare sector, in the, in the British case, uh, healthcare sectors, where they talk about the key lines of inquiry. And I am of the opinion uh, that it is time for Africans to incorporate that also in their own healthcare system, so that the healthcare system should be caring enough, it should be responsive to the patient's needs, it should be effective, it should be well-led, it should be served. Those are some of the things which I am proposing that we should then we have also the six C's of medicine, where we talk about the issues of commitment, we talk about aspects relating to courage, we talk about communication, we talk about competence. These are some of the aspects that if you want to co-create a better healthcare system, then all these aspects must come into place. It is not sufficient for your, a doctor to come out and say that we tried our best, we are sorry, uh, we could not make it as they are always eloquent in Africa in saying when things are wrong. But I am going to submit that an apology, it is not, it's not an apology until certain uh, elements uh, are incorporated. Uh, uh, now Tata, we look you've at got aspect, one minute. Could you wrap up? We look, at the, we look at the aspect of that duty of candor, which I am proposing that we should now incorporate in our healthcare system. And the duty of candor, uh, it, it requires that whenever we want to apologize, there should be a, an expression of regret, explanation of what happened, what went wrong, acknowledgement of responsibility, declaration of repentance, repair of the damage, and request for forgiveness. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, uh, permit me now to submit from the spiritual dimension. I know I have a limited time now, but permit me to descend from the views of Mother Teresa when she said, if you enter into a community and discover that there's darkness, do not complain about the darkness. Simply light a candle and encourage your neighbor to light a candle. And by the time you discover 
the whole system will be lightning. Now that we represent patients here, please get back to your communities and be the light that we want. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Council Emily Tata, CEO of the Center for Promotion and Protection of Patient Rights in Cameroon. From all the declarations and, and patient rights that you have given us today, we can see that you are an expert in your field. Now, Chief Tata quickly took us through. Uh, he started by telling us that the health, our health in Africa is generally undermanaged and that we don't really have a pharma industry. Um, I would say we just need to develop it more. And I'm happy to let us know that the, the African Medicines Agency Pretty Alliance almost seen the light of the day now. I'm sure that all that will be a thing of the past and we will have a very found pharma industry in mind. Africa as a whole. Um, Chief Kaka also talked about the fact that we need to innovate. Definitely, there is no doubt about the fact that we need to innovate and to cook it, but I'm sure. He also talked about the importance of not just innovating, but creating new things, because innovation could mean re repurposing, reusing old things, but he also emphatically talked about creating uh, new things. And he said, if we don't do that, then we will be suffering from continental amnesia. I love that short thing. Continental amnesia. That is, Africa must remember what it has gone through as a continent. Keep that in mind and keep innovating and creating new things so that we will never ever go back to the bad uh, path. And um, he told us as far back as 1948, we had the first declaration on patient rights. So patient rights or the right to health is a very, very important thing and it dates very far back, so we need to move forward. And he concluded by telling us, not because he wanted to pronounce doom, but he said COVID-19 is not going to be the last pandemic. So we need to be innovative, we need to be on our toes, we need to create new things, he told us about what Madagascar created. We may say part of it failed, but there's nothing wrong in starting the, the, the journey with the first step and then you keep co-creating and improving on it. And he also told us about ginger and lemon in Cameroon, which I think is being used all over Africa. So thank you very much, uh, Chief uh, Consul. We really enjoyed your um, speech and paper and uh, we will be forwarding to you questions at the same time. So I have the privilege now to introduce to us the last speaker for this session, a very quiet, um, unassuming lady, um, because we had a pre-meeting before this and I, I just saw her body language, quiet, unassuming, but highly intellectual, obviously, and I'm sure she's gonna give us a lot of great facts today. And she's also a regulator. You know, regulators are very, carefully about their body language. They don't want you to feel that they've given approval when they have not. So I'll introduce to us Pamala Kama, um, the Director, Regulatory and Scientific Affairs of the Global Self-Care Federation. And she's going to talk to us about innovation in improving reach, access, and impact of healthcare through self-care. So you will now understand the rudiments of self-care, self responsible self-care, which people run away from, but it has been taken now to a new level of innovation. Innovation through improving reach, access, and impact of healthcare through self-care. Thank you very much, uh, Padmala Kamath. I hand over the floor to you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Ayapo, for organizing this event. And it's a pleasure for me to speak on behalf of the Global Self-Care Federation. The next slide, please. Let's first begin and see who we are. So uh, to briefly introduce GSCF, we represent associations and manufacturers from the self-care industry and are committed to promoting sustainable growth for better health outcomes for all. And we want to see self-care embedded in the healthcare systems. 
So we are also a go-to source uh, for self-care information, and we work closely with our members and rel relevant stakeholders to help them deliver better choice, care, value. We're also a NGO in official relationship with WHO since 1977. The next slide, please. So let's see what self-care is about. Uh, as per the definition of WHO, it's the ability of individuals, family, communities to promote health, prevent diseases, maintain health, and cope with illness and disability with or without the support of a healthcare provider. What does it refer to in addition to this? It's basically holistic choices, practices, activities. So it might include OTCs, devices, nutritive products, but it also includes making healthy choices, avoiding unhealthy lifestyle habits, making responsible use of prescription and non-prescription medications, uh, self-recognition of symptoms and being able to self-monitor and manage oneself. So one of our key goals is to see individuals across the globe become self-managers of their own health. The next slide, please. Now, in terms of self-care, there are quite a lot of benefits for individuals and for healthcare uh, systems. So let's look at what's on offer for individuals. First and foremost, it can offer a greater choice of healthcare options, specifically more accessible entries through pharmacies. I will come back to this point later in my presentation about pharmacists and pharmacies. Secondly, there is also greater value for care since people can take care of their health on their own. It has also shown that it leads to better health outcomes in long term. In terms of healthcare systems, we have seen during the COVID times in various countries, self-care can ease the burden on healthcare systems. Also, freedom for innovation and healthcare innovation is an important milestone to achieve in long term. Last but not the least, improved progress towards universal health coverage is one of the major priorities for WHO right now, and self-care can contribute to it. The next slide, please. So I explained to you what self-care right now is, but then now we are going to touch upon and see what is the future of self-care. Of course, in general, as I said, our aim is that self-care is embedded into traditional health systems, providing better choice, value, and improved health outcomes for all. However, if you look in concrete terms, we do foresee that due to rapid evolution of technology and estimated shortage of approximately 12.9 million healthcare workers by 2035, we see tech and digital healthcare to flourish and pharmacists to be the core healthcare professional facilitating self-care. In terms of individual empowerment, there is going to be a boom of telemedicine and self-care literacy. This will be the key aspect supporting individual empowerment. Moreover, in terms of self-care as a building block of universal health coverage, it is important to showcase the economic and social value of self-care to leaders, to regulators, and policymakers. Also, one important thing to remember is that global knowledge transfer for better health, better global health outcomes for all is also important. So that it's not that every geography reinvents the wheel, but experiences of different health systems are shared and repetition of mistakes are avoided. The next slide, please. Now, what does the future of self-care specifically look like in Africa? So basically we need to first see that it's rather urgent. Self-care in Africa is an urgent concept because Africa is home to 17% of the world's population. Yet there are just merely 3% of global health workforce and subsequently is subject to 25% of the world's diseases. So we need to use all the resources judiciously. The future of self-care also revolves around three enablers. The first one is prominent role of pharmacists. Like I said, wherein pharmacists offer like primary level of primary care and support in cases. And uh, more and more, we see that, you know, their role in terms of vaccination programs, community education with HIV, TB, malaria, et cetera. Secondly, like everywhere in the world, digital technologies. And thirdly, effective regulatory system to support the first two pillars of pharmacists and digital technologies and self-care in general. So let's see in the next slides what each of them have to offer. The next slide, please. 
So coming back to pharmacists, as I've mentioned a couple of times now about pharmacists, they are typically the first point of contact for a patient or a consumer. Their role involves reviewing, prescribing, dispensing, and administering medicines. In several cases, to ensure continuity of treatment, they're able to modify prescriptions, dispense alternative medications without consulting the doctor. What makes it also better is that they're able to offer drive-through services, telemedicines, and even deliver medication at your doorstep. Like it said, prevention is better than cure. So they also educate consumers and promote disease prevention. If I have to say in a nutshell, pharmacists are also gatekeepers. They prevent misuse, abuse, and use of quality, uh, and uh, encourage use of quality medications. Also, if you think of them in the context of the UHC, for example, in South Africa, 84% of the population is served by mere 30% of doctors in public practice. When pharmacists chip in, quite a lot of this 84% would be attended to. Especially during COVID, when healthcare systems were overloaded, pharmacists have emerged as a trusted source of information and advice. Now, going ahead, post-COVID, we need to build on the basis that was created during this time. To understand this role in detail and how the combination of self-care products and uh, pharmacists would work, I invite you to take a look at the joint statement uh, that GSCF prepared with FIP, which is the Pharmacists Association. The next slide, please. So like I mentioned earlier, there is a global trend of increased interest in self-care, which has been specifically triggered by COVID. Now, as per the SDG, SDG3, digital health is also a vital uh, tool to ensure good health and well-being. Digital solutions have further helped in self-care, bridging the gap between available services and patients. Digital technologies are disruptive and they are helpful in improving outcomes, aiding in access, affordability, efficiency, and sustainability while delivering quality. In the context of the African Union, digital transformation is one of the key strategic pillars and is seen as the driving force for innovative, inclusive, and sustainable growth. Not to forget, one good thing is that Africa has fewer legacy challenges. So adoption of digital solutions offers a leapfrogging opportunity. Now, there are four fundamentals of enabling digital health and technology, and these revolve around and how patient is engaged, how patients are uh, patients' education is enhanced, enabling communications with patients, and in the end, increasing access. The next slide, please. So COVID has taught us many lessons, like most of the speakers before me have said. Now, one of them is that when individuals are provided with correct information to empower them, they grab it. They grab it with open arms. During the pandemic, several governments have also reached out to their populations using digital technologies. And this communication, in our opinion, should continue going ahead in the post-pandemic world as well. The next slide, please. Uh, so digital technologies really can influence how we think, how we behave, seek care, and all of this enhances ultimately the efficiency of healthcare system. The more we can manage ourselves and triage our health conditions, the more we optimize us reaching out to a healthcare professional for help. Next slide, please. In terms of health literacy of patients, education through digital technologies is a key asset. It is a mode using which patients and consumers receive correct, reliable, trusted information on their health condition and the pro uh, product itself. This will empower the patient to self-medicate correctly. In terms of patient information leaflet that we call as e-leaflets, Going ahead, this area would also be touched upon by digitalization to contain broader information with assets such as instructional videos. The next slide, please. So in a nutshell, I'm just showing you a few examples where it has reached in Africa. Uh, this education of consumers, patients can happen in several methods. For example, it could be a formal structure like we see here that Chapra has been doing, patient empowerment tools, management of patient activity tools around process control, process management like it has been done during the COVID vaccinations and rollout, etc. The next slide, please. 
in the end it all leads us leads to increase in the access to over the counter or medications or self care products knowledge of how to address minor ailments and which product to use results in the right use of the medication e-commerce in this regard has helped increase the access emerging e-commerce regulations also aim at ensuring this supply of quality uh, of otc medications especially in light of covid where ordering stuff online using e-commerce platform also immediately means that we are maintaining social distancing the next slide please currently there are quite some disparities around the world around the availability of otc medications what's an otc what's not an otc which brings me to the next point of why we need to have proper supporting regulations that that help take up the otcs or help the right use of otcs the next slide please so coming to the last but the most important enabler is the effective regulatory framework this is the cornerstone of enabling other pillars that i mentioned above it is important that policies are supporting use of self care products to recognize and ensure faster registrations across different geographies within the african union regulatory reliance and enabling faster release of self care products to the market harmonization between the member states the african union member states for otc scheduling can reduce consumer access disparities when it comes to advertising and promotion it is important it is also an important tool to educate patients raise their awareness however in certain markets otc products have faced restricted communication to consumers due to uneven regulatory scenarios in terms of the points of sales uh, in most african markets self care products are only sold uh, through the pharmacies an option for gsl line is not permitted although this would increase the access uh, and awareness around otc products as we have seen earlier for digital marketing as africa moves towards a more technological advanced state uh, regulation endorsing digital advertising could be a key tool moving ahead the next slide please lastly i would say in all of this we see that the african medicines agency would play a fundamental role hence we urge the heads of state and governments to ratify the ama treaty as a matter of priority delaying the establishment of the ama undermines the timely access to effective quality med medications for all patients across africa that's it from me the next slide please i thank you for listening my listening to my presentation and back to ubc thank you very much padmala you can you really tackle that with great authority we can see that um, you are definitely a regulatory professional that is very very much updated and who's been very busy during this time of covid you started by talking about um, um the fact that um, the global self care organization foundation is a go to source of uh, self care information not just on the continent but on and um it's uh, it's an NGO in uh, good relations with the WHO for very many years which is quite good and then you were explained to those who wouldn't really understand the concept of um self care because a lot of people still see self care as being illegal or wrong you so you went on to explain the importance and essence of self care by defining it according to the WHO definition and then you 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 put some key words there with with or without the assistance of a healthcare professional um i know the WHO recommends responsible self medication using the 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 help of the trained healthcare uh, personnel uh, but making healthy choices for example you you may not necessarily need a healthcare personnel so that your definition is very apt and they very is the keyword that well noted and then you talked about making uh, health, healthy choices on the self uh, management as a key rule in uh, self care self monitoring and self management and they how people can best do that um you also now talked about self care in africa and uh, emphatically talked about the emerging role of the pharmacists 
in, um, in the community because they're the first point of call and the pharmacists should now take advantage of that um, vantage position to help to improve the health of Africans by making sure they provide the necessary and right type of counseling, right choices, and then also help to, to improve access, access to, to the members of the public. You mentioned also uh, digital health. So the pharmacists on one hand, digital health on one hand, and then the importance of the regulatory framework, which you say is the most important and which I agree with you. And I like the way you cap it off by talking uh, about the importance of the African Medicines Agency uh, Treaty Alliance and the subtle way in which you advocated, because we have some honorable ministers here. I mean, this event today has been um, um, chaired by our keynote speaker, who uh, is also an honorable minister of health in Africa. So you also uh, address the issue of the role of the honorable ministers of health in Africa in helping us to ratify the African Medicines Agency uh, Treaty so that the AMATA, which is the Treaty Alliance, would take off and the African Medicines Agency would take off on a proper note, properly regulated, so that patients all over Africa would have improved access, improved opportunities to self-care where it is uh, permissible, uh, that is where their conditions permit self-care and up to where it's permissible and so on and so forth. And then, um, so you emphasize and cap it by saying OTC access is the key. And you, you showed us a map that shows that OTC access varies from country to country because some countries are moving from uh, pharmaceuticals to OTC, uh, whereas some are still strictly uh, available on prescription. Thank you very much, Padmala. That was really, really good. You trashed the topic, um, uh, the way, uh, how best uh, it, it should have been tackled. So once more, I thank all of you for having listened um, through this session. Now we're going to have questions and answers. Please, if you do have a question, you can pop it in. You see a little thing on to the right of your screen. Just type in your question and send, and it will pop in and drop in here. But I will quickly read here uh, one of the comments and questions that have come in. Um, Mrs. Trudy Yakambangwe um, of Zimbabwe says, thank you, Emily, uh, for rethinking my perspective around innovation. So that is just a contribution, not really a question. And then Mr. Stephen Tumzaria uh, from Ghana says, I would like a copy of this uh, presentation. We assure you, Mr. Stephen and everybody here, that all attendees will get copies of the presentation after the meeting. Um, there's a professor that made a contribution, which um, I would like to know if our, any of our speakers can throw more insights into it. He's talking about the uh, CARP theory, C-A-R-P, uh, COVID awake repositioning protocol, the CARP theory. I would like each of the three speakers to please give us a quick insight into how moving forward in the, in the light of innovation, how do you think that this CARP theory can be um, adopted in Africa? It is, it is an innovation, and we're talking about innovation and the improved health access here. So it's a COVID awake repositioning uh, protocol. And I think it's very important because all over Africa, you see that people are not really embracing the protocols anymore. And, and so this person is uh, propounding a theory called CARP theory, COVID awakening uh, repositioning protocol. Please, can I have, for just a minute each, each of the three speakers, please let's have your views on the reawakening of the COVID protocol under this CAP theory or under whatever name um, IAPO might decide to call it. So, um, we can start in no particular order. Um, I'd like each of the three speakers to please comment on that, because we all know that in Africa, people are not really adhering to the COVID protocol. So although it's not a question, it is a big question because someone is propounding a theory on it. Thank you. 
Yes, please. Okay, we'll have Emily, Emily Sheldon will comment first, and then followed by uh, our speaker, our chief counsel, Emily Tata, and the last but not the least, uh, Padmala Kamala. Thank you. Uh, Emily, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, I, I think there's a, a limitation. We have to be unmuted. Um, yeah, so I, I can begin. I am not extremely familiar with this. Um, if it's what I think it is, it has to do with how a patient is positioned for optimal breathing during COVID. Um, we know that the way that patients lay, they're actually like getting bed sores and things like that because they have to lay on their back um, to be able to breathe properly or on their stomach or you know, however it's structured. So I think that's what I'm answering. If I'm not, if I'm answering the wrong thing, just let us know in the chat. Um, I don't know a lot about specific innovations around this area, but what I can say is, you know, going back to, to something I briefly mentioned during my talk, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that people think that innovation means technology. And I like to say that innovation is inclusive of technology, but it is not exclusive to technology. And there's a lot of other ways that we can innovate even in low tech settings. So one of the biggest examples here would be that if you come up with standard operating procedures, the best ways that uh, you can help work with patients to make sure that they maintain their health while staying in specific physical positions, you can come up with ways to train your staff to do that, right? We talked before about simulations. Do you have a dummy of a patient that you can put in a certain position and then talk about how you would need to reposition them, how you would move them around, how frequently it should happen. Once you have those standard operating procedures and you've demonstrated them, can you put a plan into place to monitor whether your nurses are following that protocol, how to follow up with additional training if it's not happening, how are you tracking what's actually happening within your hospital system? When it comes to innovation for things like that, I think especially in low resource settings, the biggest thing you can think about is what needs to be done. How do we train people so they know what to do? And how are we tracking and following up with more training if it's not being done correctly? With that, please write in the chat if you wanted me to address something different. Thanks so much. Uh, th thank, thank you very thank you. much. Um, that, that, could oh, I, Carol, could I, I think Carol Deep wants to add something. Yeah, yeah. Quickly, I, I think from Thank from you. anything that is on uh, uh, practice or medical advice, anything we we urge you to please refer to your physicians. Uh, please follow their advice. And for anything else, the WHO in in office, which is in country office, they have got a good link to the latest. Um, uh, innovation that's going on. So please refer yeah. to that. It's very important that we do not cross that boundary between physician and patient care. That's sacred. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank we have you. Two, uh, we've you. got very little time busy. We, we need to wrap okay, this session. Okay, so I'll just quickly round up. Um, I, would, I actually wanted to round up by saying that um, we need to let patients know out there that self-medication um, is I, ideally better done when, um, I mean, self-care is ideally better done when it is being done with the help of a, um, a qualified healthcare practitioner because the patient may not know when to draw the line and many have self -made, um, self done, gone into self-care without assistance and, and been misled. So, but this has been a very, very uh, useful I and mean, innovative uh, insight into self-care and into innovation and healthcare, into healthcare aspects. So thank you all once more. Thank you. Due to time limits, I may not be able to take the other two. Um, okay, I'll give, you, give them 30 seconds each, please. I think we can do that, please. Things that are already. Um, please, uh, Chief Council and. Um, oh, sorry, and um, sorry, busy. We, we do have a limit on that. We are past it. So okay, I'm really sorry. It's like we've thank run you. out of time. Sorry about that. So thank you very much. We thank our speakers.
And we thank our listeners and we hope that everybody has been appreciated for this session. Thank you all.